Good evening, Des Moines. Welcome to Doc and Lefty. My name is Blake Labinus, a.k.a. Lefty. Welcome to the Doc and Lefty program, broadcasting to you live every Tuesday from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. from the webcast1live.com studios in the scenic, convenient, well-heated Des Moines Skywalk complex. And with me, as always, is my my main man of this hour, Dr. J. Patrick Petroche. Doc, how's it going? You know... I just, I can't stand cold weather. I just can't. And I'm going to tell you, we're broadcasting from the frozen tundra of Des Moines, Iowa. Or, uh, we, you know, I wish we had something cool like Lambeau Field. <laughs> you know, the way Chris Berman says it's just great. Anyway, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, we have a show chock full of good stuff to talk about. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about... Um, the Obamacare problems that simply are not going away for President Obama. We're going to talk about how not even the French want this deal that we tried to sell to Iran. And uh, we're also going to talk about some local and, and, and local spanning into national politics. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, GOP fundraiser that went on last week. Uh, which which you missed, Lefty. You missed a, missed a really good time. I did. Uh, I uh, I missed it. Um, I think, what was it, Wednesday or Tuesday? It was Thursday. It was Thursday? Yeah, See, that's I'm, why I'm you missed even, it. <laughs> not even in the loop. But but no, last, uh, and I wasn't, I didn't do the show last week. I well, was, you weren't feeling well. I was uh, resting up. I was putting on, I was uh, trying to get back down to fighting weight to get, stay in uh, in game shape for you, Doc. Because that's right. Because you know you take thoughts. a beating on here. Yeah, that's, yeah, and, you're. And, your and, view, and, I guess. And just a few is is pretty good. Um, yeah, what, uh, a couple of friends of yours were down there. That was uh, mm-hmm. fairly nice. And that went, and uh, Phaedra and her husband went, and they had a good time. I they, heard they, I heard that she thought it was she thought that it was a uh, kind of a surreal experience. All these things are surreal. I mean, yeah. have, have you gone to the Democratic stuff? I mean, all these. I mean, the, that's the problem with these fundraisers is you get people to try to motivate the base and the. We've talked about this a lot. Your base on either side are the fringe elements, you know, you know, and is and I don't want to call the Polk County GOP fringe, but you have you know Rick Perry getting up there and talking a lot about social issues, how we need to start emphasizing you know the social issues and even more and things like that. Anyway, that's not what we're going to talk about right now. But Phaedra did think it was a surreal experience. When you're first involved, it really is. Yep. So. So uh, I guess we uh, we should probably talk a little bit about the main Central Iowa news story of the past week or two. Oh, easily, yes. Um, and that's the, uh, the the terrible tragedy that happened in Ames. I think was it last week or the week before? Remember, I'm I a week think behind it was last now. week. I think it was last week. I think it happened last Wednesday or Thursday. And just just a terrible situation for those of you who haven't been paying much attention to to this kind of stuff and I don't imagine that there's any of our listeners that uh that didn't hear about this who are from the area but for for those of you who tune in nationally internationally um a young man whose name has been released his name was uh Tyler James Comstock uh became engaged in a high speed chase in down in uh, around the campus area of Iowa State uh, Ames is the is the town where Iowa State campus is located and he became engaged in a high speed chase with police after they tried to pull him over on a routine, a routine traffic stop. I think he maybe ran a stop sign or something, or he, it was a red light. No, they, well, they weren't his dad. This is the story that has been relayed by both sides uh, of this. As, as it's come out. Yeah. Yeah. Is the, this guy who'd been in trouble before apparently was throwing a fit because his dad wouldn't buy cigarettes. That's a buy him cigarettes. And that's what dad had said. And he called the police and reported his work truck, dad's work truck, stolen. And the cops pulled up behind him and were trying to get a license plate and verification that that was really him in front of the cop. And then the guy took off. And the cops started to follow. And then somewhere in here, either the kid took off. And this is according to the dash cam. Have you seen the yeah. dash cam? Well, I haven't. I haven't. I've, I've listened to the. Uh to sort of the descriptions of it. I haven't watched the whole thing. but well, I, at some point, the kid takes off. Mm-hmm. And I don't know when the lights come on. I don't know if the lights come on and he takes off or if he takes off and the lights come on. So I but, don't think it, it, that, that doesn't, to me, that doesn't matter as much to the outcome of the, 
no. of what happened. Um, but this this young man who's 19 years old, um, he he started to evade police who were trying to pull him over, um, rammed police who became engaged in the chase several times. You hear you hear it very clearly. Uh, a lot of it happened off camera, but you hear it very clearly where he's running this truck into these cruisers trying to get away. He does it repeatedly, and then they're able to kind of kind of hem him in. And he's on he's actually on the campus at this point at the um, at where this all kind of takes the nastiest turn. They, they're able to hem him in and the co- uh, the uh, the officers were able to exit their vehicles and approach him with guns drawn. And this is where the story gets a little bit unexplained. One of the officers fired into the cabin, the, ca- the passenger compartment of the vehicle seven times, killing Mr. Comstock. And you hear quotes from the father now, uh, James Comstock, saying, I, I called the police because my son took my truck. He was angry about cigarettes, and they killed him. And you, your heart certainly goes out to a, any parent in, any kind, oh, yeah. in this kind of situation. Um, Absolutely. And you just, and you just wonder. There's, and there's two, si- there's, there's two sides to this, although people are not really kind of jumping all over the Ames police as much as you would expect in a situation like this. But... On the one hand, what's this young man thinking? On the other hand, what was the officer thinking at the time he took the shots? And I don't know that we'll ever get a, cl- a very clear picture of either of those. Certainly not from Mr. Comstock's perspective since he passed away. But it's just a, it's just well, an absolute tragedy. Well, if you well watch the dash cam. This explains a lot about the state of mind of this young man as he's being pursued. And the state of mind of the police, um, he actually stops at one point and the cruiser stops behind him. All of a sudden, he just backs the trailer right up into the back. And if the cop hadn't been able to pick quickly back up, the trailer would have gone over the top of the top of the car. Right. And then they start chasing him, pursuing. And you can hear in the background twice somebody in dispatch saying, you know, we know who he is. Maybe we should consider terminate terminating the chase. We can, we can, we and and that's that's a crucial thing in my in my opinion. Once they were able to identify the driver and identify the vehicle, what is he? I mean, they can just they can they can disengage the chase. They can sit and wait. They can sit and wait. They can apply for an arrest warrant because he's committed numerous crimes by this point and pick him up later. They didn't need to chase him, but. I mean, those are the things. I mean, there's there there are certain uh, uh, tactics that police use and have used for a long period of time. There are certain tactics that police are trained in, and that um, and 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 it's only been recently in the last few years that chases, like pursuits of vehicles in city limits, have become more and more disfavored as a tactic. But certainly for a long time, that was something that the police used. Well, you know, pretty freely. Well, consider this. Back before they had radios that could go a long way, yep. and before they had satellites, if you didn't pursue them, you let them get away. That was one of the problems with Bonnie and Clyde and, and back in the 30s. These guys would get the highest powered cars they could find. That's actually what drove development of V8s, V10s, and V12s. And that's how they got away. That's how they committed the crime. They could drive down the road, and then they were gone. And there was no way to actually catch them. Well, you have to keep in mind, you know, we're antiquated. Humans don't change, right? The reason our railroad tracks are as wide as they are because that's how wide Roman chariots were. That's just an example of how we don't change. So here's these, here's this person, and he's cutting through ISU campus. This actually happened on the ISU yep. campus. When you're a college student, you walk everywhere. There are a ton more pedestrians on ISU campus. Absolutely. And this guy was driving reckless. If you watch the cam, you're it's lucky nobody else got killed. I mean, it is an absolute miracle. You can see people diving out of the way. You can see cars slamming on the brakes, barely getting by. The the uh, trailer he's towing is just disintegrating behind him. It's just a mess. So I can see where the cops are going up there going, oh, hold on. I don't really have a choice. All the police, uh, and this is according to the, the report that was released, mm-hmm. all the police said our cars were disabled. 
His truck was sitting there at the end spinning its tires. Now, this is where I stop and go, you know what? Maybe there really needs to be an investigation because, you know, I'm a conservative. I support the police. You know, if you're going to act like a Hanyak and endanger people and you get shot and killed, that's the way it goes. Don't act like a Hanyak. Don't do things that are going to make the police feel like they have to shoot you. That's pretty simple advice. I think even an attorney would give that advice. Well, I, I certainly wouldn't advise Mr. Comstock to have done what he did. But I guess no. my question, though, well, is... Well, let me oh, finish go, my go point ahead. here. Yep. The problem really is your cars are disabled. His car is essentially disabled because he's stuck in the mud. His tires are spinning. If his, And you can hear on that dash cam, this, his engine's revved up. And you can tell he's not going anywhere. At that point, why shoot him? He's not going anywhere. You have now eliminated the threat. You can shoot the tires. You can tell him to get out of the truck. But from what I see, cop gets out, sees that he's still going to be a threat, and shoots him. Now, from my perspective, and this is the thing that always gets me whenever I'm talking about gun rights, all right? They always talk about, well, you know, geez, you can't hit what you're, what you're aiming at. Police, under these circumstances, police are notoriously bad at hitting their target. You're talking a 30-foot target that far away, and he shoots seven times and hits the kid twice. That's bad gun management, in my opinion. Now, I'm waiting for Tom Shaw to call in and tell me I'm a real dick for saying that. But the bottom line is, is that's true. You know, you got to be able to hit, make sure you hit your target. So that's my first complaint. Second, there's something called OnStar. And I know every car that ha that's a Chevy, which this truck was, has OnStar on it. And whether or not it's activated is immaterial. If the cops call OnStar and say, hey, listen, we have this guy, stole this car, he's driving around, can you shut it off? OnStar goes, certainly. Hits a button and the, the whole thing shuts off. OnStar even advertises this. Even advertises this. So they could have done it that way. They could have just shut his car off and been done. The second thing is, is they already had his name. There's no reason to pursue him. So you have two good reasons not to start a high-speed chase. Outside of the fact that the police got mad that they rammed a car and that, two, he was on ISU campus putting patients, or not patients, but students mm -hmm. at risk. That sounds like what it, that sounds, and I'm not going to psychoanalyze the police. That's not ever my job, and I'm not, and I wouldn't be good at it even if I tried. But it does seem like the, the, the immediate danger was neutralized. And you haven't heard any sort of um, um, claim or report from the officer that he had a weapon with him, and in fact, and you didn't, and you didn't hear anything from his dad about him being armed at all either. Now, it also is interesting that I think that, and and I might be, I don't have the the story in front of me, but I'm, pr I, I thought that I'd read that the officer who pulled the trigger was the same officer who tried to initiate the stop originally and maybe like you said he was angry because he'd been rammed a few times and put in danger himself yeah and that, i don't know that could be well i'm going to tell you why well, i'm going to take the final word on this i'm going to say that i think in my opinion that officer was justified in shooting mr comstock the accused i think he was justified i think there was enough there to show that really there was a danger to the to the public welfare. But being justified doesn't make it right. And I think they could have done a lot to avoid this entire thing, including the dad who tried to use the police as, a, as therapy. Police aren't for therapy. Therapists are for therapy. Police are for protecting the, the uh, public at large, and they have permission to shoot people, something that therapists don't have. So if you're thinking about trying to teach your kid a lesson by calling the cops, I would I'd ask you to reconsider that. And that comes from a psychiatric perspective. We're going to be back right after the break. We're going to start talking a little bit about local politics and uh, this fundraiser that went on last week because it was pretty interesting. Uh, we'll be back right after these messages. You're listening to Doc and Lefty on webcast1live.com. <laughs> From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. 
I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. Hey, welcome back, everybody. This is the Doc and Lefty program, and uh, we're starting off local t uh, today, which is good because the international and the national stuff is a little rough on on my team. But uh, we're we're all but Doc and I are both agreed that the local politics recently been fairly interesting. I know that uh, two that uh, we had two guests last time I was here. It was two weeks ago. We had Dave Russell and Rob Elgin on the show, running for the Ur uh, That's right. Uh, running for the two spots on the Urbandale uh, City Council, and Dave Russell was elected along with incumbent, uh, was it Rob Pogue? Were there two Robs running? No, Ron and Rob. Ron Pogue. Ron Pogie. Ron apparently. Pogie. Okay. Dave Russell and, and uh, incumbent Ron Pogie uh, won back his seat. And uh, and I I gotta say I didn't have a uh, a pony in that particular race stock. Obviously, I don't live in Urbandale anymore. But I was really impressed by Rob Elgin's uh, um, interview with us by his policy positions. And it was you got when you get to know a guy, especially in a nonpartisan sort of election like a city council race, you get to know one of the candidates a little bit on a personal level and listen to how he answers some of the issues. It was kind of a bummer that he uh, wasn't able to pull it out there at the end. Yeah, and he got. Uh, what I what I saw here is Dave Russell got the majority of votes, mm -hmm. and then Ron Pogi came in second. And unfortunately, uh, well, I I don't know. I shouldn't. I should try to stay as neutral as I can. Uh, Ron El Rob Elgin got um got about thirteen percentage points behind that. Oh, now here's the thing. What what the Republicans know is Democrats in Republican districts are stealth Democrats. They don't ever advertise that they're a Democrat. John Forbes, when he won, won because he didn't advertise he was a Democrat in Urbandale. Same thing with Rob Elgin. The problem is, is after John Forbes got elected, everybody went, oh, hey, wow, well, that happened, right? So now everybody double checks everything, and there's certain phraseology that Democrats use that basically means we like to raise your taxes. And unfortunately, I think Rob used those kind of phrases on his website. And I think people figured it out. Now, I, I, it's tough to ha have a Democrat impress me, but Rob really impressed me. I, he was really thoughtful. He took on some questions I thought were, were f pretty tough. And honestly, I thought I, we were, you and I were tougher on Rob than we were on Dave. So that's my opinion. Well, so I really liked having him on and I, I appreciate having him on. I guess what I would, I would say, I guess I don't maybe understand Urbandale the Urbandale political landscape the same way that you do, but I would have imagined that no one advertised their uh, their party affiliation during this particular race, and no one, and real and the voters are really supposed to disregard that because it's more of a managerial um, kind of relationship, and and uh, local governments don't have much taxing or spending or appropriation authority. It's most you know so many, the way that Iowa is set up, and you've been around Iowa a lot longer than I have. Um, local governments are much more dependent on the state for revenue and expenditures and things of that nature than they are self-sufficient entities on themselves. Well, that's true. Do you, and you'd agree, you'd agree with that. And, yes. and not having lived in other states for, um, for, for a significant amount of time, I don't know if that's the norm state to state. If, if, uh, most cities are, are fairly, uh, um, autonomous and other places, say like in Texas or Wisconsin or other states around the country, but Iowa, um, we're pretty we're pretty connect, uh, interconnected that way, and so um, it's uh, just it's interesting that you have it's it seemed like the race was there's a lot of dissatisfaction 
in how Urbandale had been handling certain policy positions, like the the TIF finance or the TIF, the uh, the the stormwater issue, and some of, and the officer, the uh, police force, um, sort of making statements that they felt understaffed. Yes, and and I thought that, and not and I think we extended an invitation, to Mr. Pogi, and he declined to come on the show, but. Well, let me let me correct you. He did not decline. He did not decline. Well, technically he did, but he said, "Well, one, I have a city council meeting this not tonight, which makes it tough oh, scheduling." And then okay. the next week he was doing his his thing, but he did sure. say, "You know, we'll we'll come on later." Sure. Because um, his wife emailed me, or well, I'm assuming it's his wife, emailed me, and and she was cordial but very short, <laughs> and said, "You know, he did not just not come on. He." Okay. Okay. Well, then, then I, I take that back. So it was a scheduling issue, and we can, maybe we can talk, have a chance to talk to Mr. Pogi later on in the uh, in the next couple of weeks. But um, I guess that the race that the race city council races are almost never contested unless there's some dissatisfaction in the ranks. You can look at that two, one or two ways. One, the voter uh, the the voter base is not very well informed, so they just kind of vote the incumbents in because they don't know any better. Or two, that they're satisfied with the job that the people who are in power that they've elected are doing. And so I think that on the one hand, having the incumbent win in Urbandale over top of the some of the discord that some of the people in the city had been feeling. I know that your your water rates were a big concern for you personally. The, well, t- the TIF it, financing, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the, the, the creeping upwards of taxes labeled as fees. And so you wonder how you wonder how yeah. that happening on an incumbent's watch, if a lot of people were motivated to vote on that issue, how he was able to to win out over yep. Some new blood, but that well, it is what it is. Well, the other thing is, is for me, it was very telling that you know Senator Brad Zahn, who is a very staunch Republican, conservative Republican, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, with bona fide conservative credentials, endorsed the Democrat Dave Russell, but not the incumbent. That was to me. I went, wow, that's really something. So I don't know. Uh, hopefully we can get uh, Mr. Pogue on, uh, Mr. Pogi on, so we can uh, discuss his part of it. Let's go on to the to the to the fundraiser. Do you well, mind hey, go go ahead. All right. First of all, my stud producer Frank indicated to me that I said a word, the D word, in the last segment, and apparently I'm not allowed to say that. So I apologize to everybody that uh, I've offended, and I apologize to the our studio boss Mac. And we'll have to edit that out. Number two, Polk County GOP fundraiser was really quite a bit of fun. Um, it it started out, everybody's out in the lobby. Uh, they had a VIP section, which uh, was really pretty fun. Uh, what's really What really strikes me is how short people from Texas are. I've met several people from Texas in, in my political career, and I walk up and I tower over these guys. You know, I towered over George Bush. I towered over... Uh, Rick Perry, and I'm like, how, you know, I, wow, you guys are short. And it's supposed to be the land of the Giants down here, right? Everything's supposed to be bigger in Texas. So anyway, and don't get me wrong, Rick Perry was very cordial. Uh, even though I'd met him before, you know, obviously when you're running for president, you meet a lot of people. And so he didn't quite remember me, plus I look a lot different. So he's very mm-hmm. cordial. It was very nice. Everybody that was re- running for uh, Senate was there. Uh, I interacted with with most of them, and I can tell you just the flavor of watching the the how they work the crowd. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I think Joni Ernst is is starting to really to pull away. Sam Clovis, uh, I didn't see him there, uh, but he had his people there, and that's important. And uh, um, you know, they got up there, they had their speeches. This was the shortest set of speeches. I think ever in the history of anything political, Rick Perry, I don't know. He was up there for maybe 15 minutes, uh, just rah, rah, siskumba kind of stuff. It is very telling that he was thanking all the Republican governors and, and left Chris Christie out. Did he uh, really? Yes. And, um, I think that's that, your nominee in 2016, but that's boy. not, that's not our nominee in 2016. I can tell you the moment he put his arm around Obama and said, thank you during the hurricane thing, he was done. Now, you can sell Iowa short, but keep in mind, Iowa is where Obama got his boost. We are, in essence, the Iowans, the ones that elected Obama. 
because after that, Hillary couldn't overcome it. She just was always playing from behind. Well, here's okay. So, go ahead. Fin- uh, fin- finish your point because this is something. This no, go ahead. Well, I, this relates back to a larger narrative, and I wanted and I want I'll bring it back specifically to this fundraiser because it feels like to me that the Democratic Party in Iowa, at least, has a handle on its its national political reputation. For example. Uh, the the uh, the election of or the Obama prevailing in 2008 and winning in Iowa basically and, and how that was a predictor for how the the rest of the uh, the um, the race was supposed to go. Mike Huckabee won in 2008. Didn't get anywhere. Didn't even sniff the nomination. 2012, Rick Santorum maybe won. Maybe it was maybe it was uh, Mitt Romney. Then it was Ron Paul with all the delegates. Two out of three of those guys didn't even sniff the nomination nationally. You wonder, do the Democrat caucus, does the Democratic caucus process in Iowa work better, is better organized, have its finger on the pulse of national politics a little bit better, or are the Republicans so in Iowa so out of touch that they can't elect a national candidate? And yeah. I'll bring that back to the fundraiser. Did you see anybody at the fundraiser? like a Rick Perry maybe, even though I kind of laugh up my sleeve at the idea of Rick Perry trying to run for president again after his showing in 2012, that looks like a national front runner for the 2016 uh, caucus nomination here in Iowa. You know, that's discussed a lot. The bottom line is, is at this point, from this conservative's viewpoint, and this is just my opinion, there isn't a front runner. And unless Mike Huckabee comes into it, there isn't going to be one. Uh, it's going to be a big old mud fest like it was in 2008. Uh, Huckabee really, I mean, he fought it all the way to the end. Iowa gave him a boost. And the problem is, is he's dealing with the establishment. Now, the other thing that makes me think Joni Ernst is really going to be the nominee, one, her fundraising is far and away better than everybody else's. Three, two, two times, three times the next person coming up. Uh, number two, she is going out and meeting with all the Republican establishment people. Like or hate John McCain, he's a power broker in the Republican Party, so you have to get his approval. She's out meeting with all kinds of people. Uh, the lieutenant governor has already endorsed her. I mean, Branstad never endorses anybody until the you know until they're running. But the fact that the that lieutenant governor has already endorsed her means that she, she, Branstad's already kind of said, yeah, we're willing to go. Now, the problem that you run into is already the conservatives on my side are already attacking her for being a sellout to the middle, being a sellout to the to moderates and the liberals in the in the Republican Party. Bottom line is, is you got to win. Uh, Uncle Bob Vanderplot says it best. You can't lead if you don't win. And Joni is out there trying to figure out how to win. Sam Clovis, I think, is the one that's most articulate. And he's the one that's able to get up there and say exactly what he thinks and exactly what he means. The problem is, is he does have a tendency to alienate people out in the audience. And the others, I mean, David Young, I think he's dead in the water. You know, I've met him a couple of times. I think he's an all right guy. But really, the Republican base, the conservatives and the Christians that provide the money for the rest of the Republicans, we're done with the party establishment. We're not, if you're even, I mean, coming from Grassy's office doesn't help you, does not help you. And then they have Mark Jacobs. I haven't met him. Do you think that's, Matt do you think Whitaker. that, do you think the idea, well, okay. Uh, do you think that, <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that coming from the, uh, the, having that attitude toward the establishment is helpful or harmful to the Republican party? Well, I, I think, I don't know. Something has to happen. Mitch McConnell sells over, for a three billion dollar bridge or something like that, from where he's from, mm-hmm. it was just a giant. Hey, we're gonna. This is because this is what it makes it look like. Hi, we're gonna hold up the government so we can get another twenty billion dollars for pet projects here on the Republican side. That's what it looks like. And every fiscal conservative out there has gone. Mitch McConnell needs to go. John Boehner needs to go. And it's not even things we whisper among each other now. We're telling everybody these guys have to go. These guys are part of the problem, and now I'm one of them. And, you know, I'm a little bit more outspoken than most, but really our leadership 
is what the problem is. So do you think it's the leader? The I mean, because the leadership of the Republican Party would consist of in in Washington anyway, and we can get to Iowa, I suppose, um, if if we if we have time. But that leadership would be Mitch McConnell, John Boehner, Eric Cantor, um, I guess. Uh, uh, Paul Ryan was is still on that mix, and he's kind of been dubbed in the Beltway as the Tea Party Whisperer. He's the guy that seems to they trust him enough. You know, they're they're they 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 get treated the Tea Party and uh, the Tea Party Republicans in, in the House of Representatives get treated by the media as this like this this cadre of of very paranoid nervous people that if you have the stink of Washington on you, they will bolt for the next the first exit. And and Paul Ryan is kind of the guy that can sort of keep them all calmed down and and hey yeah. here's a little bit yeah. of we're gonna cut some stuff some, some spending here we're gonna roll back some reproductive rights here but it'll be okay so don't worry about it and I just wonder does that mean then that there are no good estab- quote unquote establishment leadership that you know in that second or third tier does it have to come from this sort of you know kick the bums out and burn the house down group of the Republican Party. Well, that's that's where we're at. I mean, how many presidential elections do you have to lose before you catch on? How many seats in the Senate can we miss out on before you go, listen, something's wrong here? We've talked about this before, mm-hmm. that a lot of the Republican leadership are doing it old school. And the problem is, is we're getting schooled old school fashion by using by these by these new whippersnappers coming up. I don't know how else to say it. We've been out organized. We haven't been out fundraised. We no. actually keep out raise, keep raising more money than the Democrats. But our organization and our message is not getting through. It simply isn't. Now, we're going to take a quick break. Well, actually, this is a long break, and we'll be back right after that. You're listening to Doc and Lefty on webcast1live.com. We want to thank all of our sponsors. They help us keep the lights on. Petrosh and Associates will provide you with a friendly, caring, and confidential place to find help for mental health concerns. We are ready for your call. We are proud to work with military personnel and their families. Our doctor, Dr. J. Patrick Petrosh, provides a full range of psychiatric services for children, adolescents, and adults in a forthright and informative manner while maintaining a casual, comfortable, and relaxed atmosphere. Our licensed mental health therapists provide individual counseling to children, adolescents, and adults, including couples and marital counseling. Visit our website at BertrochAndAssociates.com for more information or call 515-334-9484. Our offices are located at 5525 Meredith Drive in Des Moines, just east of Skate North off Merle Hay Road. Isn't it time to talk to someone? Take care of yourself and your family. Contact Bertroche and Associates. Hey, welcome back, everybody. This is Lefty with Doc and Lefty. Thanks for sticking around for the first half of the show. And you know, at this at this juncture, we like to, I like to talk about some things that are kind of you know a little looser, a little bit uh um uh kind of just not as heavy, right? Absolutely. And you know, I don't really have. I'm just kind of speaking off the cuff, and I just wanted to um kind of let everybody know that yesterday and this is going to sound weird because I, I said you know a little looser a little a little not as as heavy but yesterday was veterans day and uh um doc and i have family close family who uh had the opportunity and the desire and frankly the uh, the guts to put their lives on the line for this country and so um, I just wanted to, and we didn't get to, you know, obviously didn't get to do it on Monday because there, the show runs Tuesday, but I, I wanted to express my deepest and sincerest thanks for all veterans, not only in my family and Doc's family, but in all of our listeners' families. I know most of you have got somebody in your life who's been touched by the, the United States military in some capacity. I just thank you from the bottom of my heart um, and for all that you do for this country and, and for the world at large. We're not just a uh, singular, isolated community. We're a global community, and we really do appreciate your service and your sacrifice and thank all of your families, your loved ones, and everybody who ha- um, is in uh, in your lives as well. Thank you so much, and we really do appreciate it. Amen to that. So, um, well, so anyway, the uh, this fundraiser was really quite quite good. Uh, we I really enjoyed myself. I think Phaedra and Annette and Phaedra's husband really 
I think his name is Chris. Mm-hmm. Is that his name? And uh, they all had a really good time. Uh, the senator, Senator Grassley, actually showed up, and he didn't get any speeches. He did stand up in the middle, <laughs> up in his up in his chair. He just stood up. Here's a guy almost ninety years old jumping up on a on a chair so everybody can see him. So you know, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that you know makes makes Chuck very popular. Um, so you know, I think I I think that Johnny Ernst is starting to run away with this a little bit. Uh, the problem is, is other conservatives, uh, you know, like the Iowa Republican with Craig, uh, Craig Robinson and, uh, um, uh, oh geez, Steve Dace, they're all attacking her for trying to get the Washington power brokers lined up behind her. That's who she needs to be able to beat, to beat Bruce Braley, who is out raising all the Republicans combined. I think he's got $1.5 million in his war chest. And I don't know how in the world I wound up on his mailing list. I really don't. And they're emailing two or three times a day. Send a dollar for this, five bucks for that. It's really an effective program. I mean, it's amazing. Well, you know, it's he was always kind of the the uh, and this is and and honestly, this kind of once again demonstrates just how sort of together the Democratic Party is right now. And how this is not this is not your your dad's or your granddad's Democratic Party anymore. This is this is sort of the Republican Party of the '80s. Even even with a lot of their policy prescriptions, to tell you the truth, they're organized. They they have a uh, they have sort of a lineup of candidates that they're that they trot out there when quote unquote the candidates are ready and uh, and sort of uh, um, passing the torch from one to the next the way that Republicans used to do it in the '80s and the '90s and really it's it, it worries me as a democrat it worries me because when a party gets too comfortable when a party gets too sort of machine oriented is when it only takes one unexpected loss to really start to rattle the cage um i i look I, I look back to uh to 2006 and all and the landslide of democratic victories that happened in 2006 and how i mean you guys had just reelected the president, one of the most, at the time, one of the most unpopular presidents in the last 30, 40 years. I mean, he not quite LBJ in the middle of Vietnam unpopular, but George Bush was certainly unpopular with the country. They just, and the, we, we, we don't need to litigate that election, but he was not as popular as he, as he maybe would have been without the Iraq war. Let's put it that way. Reelected him and then swept both houses, lost both houses. It was in 2006. And I think that was the beginning of really rattling the cage of the Republican Party, and yeah. which had become very, very comfortable with the uh, uh, 94, 96, 98, and 2000 elections. It just, you just kind of well, wonder, are the Democrats heading for the same kind of well, the cliff? Problem, well, I will tell you, there's, there's three different problems with what has happened with the Republican Party. The first one, the very first one, you got a bunch of old guys that can't change trying to figure trying to redo the same thing over and over. It's like our military. If we're trying to fight in Afghanistan, we really are having to learn some hard lessons. Fighting in Iraq simple because all we do is what we did in World War II. So we have people that aren't keeping up with the technology, aren't looking at the demographics that aren't trying to message the people we need to message. Uh, Lefty and I have talked about this before. The if you look at the typical L- L- Latino voter, they agree almost all the way down the board with Republican platforms until you get to immigration reform. And I still disagree with you on most of that, but go on. No, no, but if you look at it, they they don't. I mean, you even brought it up. Well, for the first time, Latinos are actually more in favor of gay marriage because they just hit the fifty percent mark. Well, what does that tell you? They're, they're, they agree a lot with the Republican Party. We can say at least they agree a lot with us. Maybe not everything lockstep. But the bottom line is we need to be down there talking to people. At the Republican picnic, they were down there at the Latino Festival. They pulled people out of that to come talk to old white guys. People are already going to vote for you. If you already have people going to vote for you, go get new voters. Stay down there at the Latino Festival. But they didn't. And I just think, you know, that's the old way of thinking. Number two. We're so far behind in the technological arena, and we just are. It doesn't matter what the Republicans do. We cannot get things organized socially on these social media things. 
It just doesn't happen. You look at the we'll look at the website, right? There's no, I mean, they have a Facebook, they don't post. They have a Twitter, they don't tweet. You got to do those things. You know, we don't, we don't, we Facebook a little bit, but we don't tweet, you know, and mm-hmm. you're even a lot younger than I. And the third thing is they just simply don't understand that you can't just keep going out doing the same old things. At the end of the election, Mitt Romney, I think they said he had $50 million, $60 million left over. And that's why he was can- throwing up commercials in all these different places. Commercials aren't going to win you elections anymore. They just aren't. You have to get out there. You have to deliver your message. You have to deliver it consistently. And that's something that Obama has done over and over and over. He stays focused on message. And even to his detractors within the party that attack him, he still doesn't get distracted from his message. He shrugs and goes on. Romney would look like, I mean, really, it looked like this. From my perspective, he was chasing down every negative news article and trying to justify it. Then he would flip, then he would flop, and it just didn't work. So you have those problems going on. So you think you think that the issue with the Republican Party is mainly structural, has nothing to do with their message? I think it has to do with they're not – if you if you don't have the structure, you can't deliver your message. I don't think there's – everybody has a message. Not everybody's going to agree with it. You, you The Democratic Party has problems with its message, just like the Republicans have problems with its message. Not everybody in the, Repub- in the Democratic Party agrees with the party platform. You've even said it. The, the unions sometimes hold their nose. You've said that very phrase on mm-hmm. the show. Mm-hmm. So you can't get one party that fits everybody, but you got to have a party that fits most of the people that believe the way you do. The second thing I want to point out here is Democrats are great at co-opting Republican ideas. The health insurance ex- exchanges co-opted from the Republicans. And then two, delaying Obamacare. That's not a Republican idea. Looks like even the Democrats are getting on board with that. Yeah. I just want to point that well, out this week. Hold on week. a second. Hold I just want to point that out. There's okay. two two Democratic senators saying, "Hey, maybe we got to wait." You can put, you can point out all you want, and you can say co-opt all you want, but isn't that the whole point? Isn't the point? Isn't if if they had the the health insurance the health insurance exchange? Now you can talk. We can talk all we want about whether or not the that the Affordable Care Act is the most uh, is the is the socialist takeover of medicine. We both know that's not true. We both know that it's just that's a ridiculous, ridiculous it, it provides, thing to say. It provides the framework for a socialist takeover. It, that is, we can't agree. No, on that. We, we we don't agree on that at all because it is. It's not a framework. Even even Obama says it's simply a framework. It's it's instructing people to buy private insurance. It's instru- It's it's uh um funneling people to private corporations is what it's doing. Anyway, so we have we have that piece of it, and we're talking about ways to make the law better, and. Are you, are you saying and here's and this is this is what's great about the Republican approach to to healthcare reform is you have the the Republicans saying hey you know you're taking our ideas here we're ta- you're taking the exchanges and you took the mandate and that was our idea but they're not mad that the Democrats are getting credit for it they're saying those are terrible ideas and we should have never come up with them in the first place we're gonna we're gonna be back right after the break you're listening to the doc. <laughs> And Lefty on the Doc and Lefty program here on webcast1live.com. We're here every Tuesday from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Please stay tuned. We'll be back right after the break. Petrosian Associates, how can I help you? Petrosian Associates will provide you with a friendly, caring, and confidential place to find help for mental health concerns. We are ready for your call. Our doctor, Dr. J. Patrick Petrosian, provides a full range of psychiatric services for children, adolescents, and adults in a forthright and informative manner while maintaining a casual, comfortable, and relaxed atmosphere. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Save us! Help! Somebody save us! Somebody help! Help! Save us! Hi, I'm Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. Hooray, we're saved! Consumer Credit, you're our hero! 
from the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios. This is Webcast One Live. Hey, welcome back, everybody. This is the last segment of the show. And uh, right before the break, you heard me basically make the best point that's ever been made on this show about anything that the Republicans, <laughs> the Republicans. What, that Frank's a great producer? Hey, I he agree. A, you know what? You know what? He's fantastic. And we really do appreciate him. I want a quick, quick shout out to our producer, uh, it, I, Ryan, but yeah. but uh, Doc calls him Frank for you know because because I'm the Doc. He, yeah, that's that's right. He's the same same guy that calls the individual mandate some sort of uh, socialist boondoggle. But it is a socialist boondoggle <laughs> that the Heritage Foundation came up with back in the nineties. Okay, that's, and I didn't agree with them that, then. That's that's fine. But damn socialists. So <laughs> they I, penetrate everywhere. You I can't think, trust them. I think the Heritage Foundation would take issue with you calling them a socialist organization. <laughs> well, they can take issue all they want. <laughs> All I have to, but but you hear you hear you hear Doc bemoan Democrats co-opting Republican ideas that Republicans are running away from as fast as they can. So if you're talking about how to fix the law that is in place, rather than replace it, repeal it and replace it with nothing, that's yeah. the that is the Republican alternative is to replace it with nothing. Then. Those co-opting, uh, the that co-opt of a of a Republican idea that looks more like compromise to me, and oh. I know that's a dirty word to you Republicans, Uh-oh. but it looks that looks like compromise. Uh, I have a comment about Obamacare on Twitter or on. Uh, okay. I well, actually, I can't see what it is because I don't have my glasses. Anyway, says he, meaning you, mm-hmm. isn't in medicine. Tell him you're going to tell him how to practice law, and everybody should charge the same uh, attorney fees. Well, that's. I mean, no, that's what hey, that's, that's kind what of what Obamacare the, does. That's sort of what the state already does. I mean, it's it's obvious that yeah. that person's not in the law well, either. Now, so I mean, now, it, the, the truth of the matter is, you take state contracts, you have to charge yeah, the same for the whatever. Truth, I'm gonna, I'm going to paraphrase Lewis Black here because I think he said it best. We're dealing with a party of bad ideas versus the party of no ideas. And the truth of the matter is, is you have people that are brilliant statesmen on both sides of the aisle, but collectively and this is what we know in psychiatry individually people are smart collectively we are stupid and you get a bunch of people up there who are trying to make deals to benefit themselves so they can get reelected you get the kind of crap that goes on now you get the kind of government that really we deserve and i think i want to say it again term limits you limit these guys to 12 years out there and they can't lobby afterwards suddenly you get a lot better government honest to goodness i i believe this with all my heart now, there's a lot of things wrong with Obamacare. There's, and I know the Heritage Foundation came up with a lot of these ideas. They were terrible back then. These are bad ideas. Now, the exchange isn't too bad, but the problem is to really make an exchange functional, you need to remove the state limit, the state monopolies on insurance companies. Let people compete across the nation. Number two, everybody's up in arms. This is, a, this is something where I'm going to say the Republicans are wrong on all over social media. Hey, listen, guys have to pay for pregnancy insurance, right? Well, I hate to tell you this, that's already been mandated. That was mandated back in the middle 70s, I think. Uh, I know uh, on my insurance, because I have group insurance, Yep. I have to pay in case I get pregnant. And, and now, no. I look like I'm pregnant, but I'm not. Because if I was, I, if nine months from now, I'd be thin again. Do you also have a, uh, do you also have, you don't have any young children either, do you? No. But if you went to buy a car, you would, you'd would probably buy a car that has some sort of harness that you could hook a baby seat into, a car seat. Because most of the cars that you buy now have that kind of function. In. There are minimum standards for pretty much everything that we have. There are minimum standards that, uh, the safety standards that cars have to go through to have a car. This idea that it's such a problem to have a minimum standard to make a health care plan makes sense to anybody flies in the face of everything else that we do well but the, but here's the problem aside from the fact that well, guys marry women who have babies well well and great but why should i have to carry insurance to be pregnant see the one size fit all doesn't work the other thing is and this, i know you bring this one up if you go back and look before seat belts were mandated seat belts were available it, before airbags were mandated Airbags were available, period. So the government isn't doing anything that the private sector wasn't already ahead on, ahead of it on anyway. Do you remember people and the fit they threw when the seatbelts became the law of the land? 
having to wear them became law of the land. That's, That's what I'm true. saying. That's what I'm saying. The fit they threw, and oh, now yeah. everybody does it. Now everybody does it because they realized after 15 years that having the, that being forced, quote unquote, to wear the seatbelt was probably better than having the choice to fly through your windshield at 65 miles an hour. That's the that's the whole point. That's well, the whole that's the whole but that, point. But that's not the point you made before. The point was is you know, geez, we have to have minimum standards. Well, but wearing your seatbelt doesn't fall under that minimum standard. You can thing. have that. You can. I have, don't have to buy. I don't have to buy. You know, insurance in case my you know tree falls through my work, roof. That's kind of covered underneath there. The problem is being forced to buy coverage for that, flooding when you live in a desert. Right, that's the kind of stuff drives up costs. Things that just don't matter. That's the nature of insurance. You, I, I, I do not you, believe you sh- for one second that you don't understand the nature of casualty insurance and risk pools because I know that you do. I do, but but before these regulations, you could say, well, hold on, she's a woman, so we're going to give her pregnancy coverage. Great, you tick that off, and you and you pay more for it. Uh, I'm a big fat guy. I have diabetes. Check. I have to pay more for it. The bottom line is, is Obamacare is completely dependent on Frank's generation to pick up and pay for insurance they don't need and won't use, most likely, to be able to pay for old fat guys like me. How is that fair in any circumstance? That's insurance. That's insurance. That's the def. Thank you for laying out the definition of insurance. People who don't use insurance pay for the people who do. That's what it is. That's the that's the exact definition of a casualty pool. But yeah, it's a casualty pool. Not everybody has to get in. That's why they call it insurance. Yeah, you know, nobody, okay. I mean, so no, people no. don't. So if people don't get into it, then it just dissolves, and you. It doesn't dissolve. It didn't dissolve before now. That's we, because we have insurance, so everybody has insurance. It hasn't dissolved before now. The insurance is fine. It is government oh, regulations. It's f- oh, it's fine. Government oh. regulations the about me having to be insured about being pregnant drives up the cost for everybody else. The previous way that we were running insur- health insurance in this country was fine. Really? Really? I have said this a hundred times. It has been the government interference that has created all these rules and these monopolies. The people that are making the money off Obamacare are Obamacare cronies, like the United Healthcare. That guy raises six hundred thousand dollars. Suddenly, their stock is going th- for Obama. Suddenly, their stock is going through the roof. Hmm. You know, uh, I for- I can't remember. See, now you got me so upset I can't hey, remember. Make sure but that you take I- your tin hat off before you use your microwave tonight. Because oh, oh, that- no, no, now that's just out of line and uncalled for. Hey, well, out of you line know, and uncalled for. Drop, that's gonna, not a tin foil hat. That's the you're that going to accuse were- you're going to accuse the administration of crony capitalism and that is favoritism. Right. That's what I'm accusing the Obamacare program. administration. You're going to accuse him of that and just drop that on the table and walk away. That's what you just did. You're going to drop it and walk away. That's Well, you know what? Turnabout's fair play. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. <laughs> We've had a great show. Thanks for tuning in. Let, we'll come back to this next week because I think that's probably a, a subject me and the lefty could get into. want to thank all of our sponsors. Thanks for tuning in. See, we got a couple of new ones for the studio. Thank you for, for watching. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Lubinus Law Firm, Betrosian Associates, uh, Polk County GOP, and most of all, our wonderful uh, uh, producer, Frank, for tuning in. We'll be back here next week. Another bit of news. One, we're even more of a business now. We're getting there. We got our cards. Woo! If you want one, call Check out the website. Know. And the website works, and we're going to start blogging. Uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you. Cheers. Hi, I'm Representative Tom Shaw, and I love these guys. Both of them. Love these guys. <laughs> Get over here. Get over here. Love both of them.